All right, so I want to um, spend some time uh, talking about some kind of more high level um, comments uh, as it relates to far right extremism in the United States, although clearly it's a global uh, problem. Um, my comments today will be primarily restricted to, to the US context, but actually I want to start with a thank you to the HFG for um, the initial award uh, back in 2012, so it's been a decade, um, uh, and obviously uh, lots changed in terms of the world uh, over the last 10 years, and uh, lots happened with our research. I'll talk about a few of those things. Um, and uh, But first, just an acknowledgement to the HFG for their support. Um, that initial award in 2012 led to a series of interviews with former far-right extremists who had been involved in violence in varying degrees and varying ways. Um, we were able to complete interviews with 30 um, individual participants in, in that project. It was really an individual level focus in terms of life course trajectories from kind of a life course criminological perspective and looking at uh, different aspects of, of their uh, childhood and adolescence. We found some interesting things as it relates to trauma in particular and how violence impacted their lives. Um, that, that, um, that award really uh, provided seed data in, in many respects, uh, baseline data that then was used for, for a number of other uh, federal grant uh, awards that uh, has helped also further our research. And our life history data set of, of former um, right wing extremists now totals of more than 100. So we've been able to expand that, that original um, data that we collected with the award back in 2012 and continue working on a number of different aspects of, of this uh, research as it relates to far right extremism. Um, today, I, I really, though, want rather than drilling down on some of these individual level issues that drove this initial uh, project and this initial award. I really want to talk about some broader issues um, as, as it relates to where things stand today in terms of far right extremism in the US, what we've been able to learn about the topic, really, um, not only over the last 10 years, but over the last 25 years. Um, and then in Q&A, happy to get into some of those more individual level findings if, if folks are interested. So start off with, um, you know, discussion about terminology. And, and far-right extremism uh, really is a broad umbrella term in, in many respects. Um, and, it, and it really is a, a way to characterize certain beliefs and feelings. And, and I think I underscore the feelings part. Emotions are really critical to understanding, you know, really any kind of um, uh, political movement. Emotions are, are very uh, core to human behavior more broadly. So certainly any kind of political movement, emotions are very uh, important to understand. And certainly that's the case here with far right extremism. We're, we're as much talking about emotions as we are talking about beliefs. Uh, but but really at the core, I would say, uh, in terms of beliefs are a sense of anti government uh, uh, sentiment, especially directed towards the federal government and then racial resentment, a, a sense that whether it be um, certain um, uh, communities uh, traditionally in the United States among white supremacists in particular, but more broadly, certainly uh, a sense that uh, African Americans, for example, are benefiting unfairly uh, from certain government programs. Uh, so for example, the idea of affirmative action being reverse uh, racism as it's sometimes referred to by folks who, who tend to have these views. Uh, a sense that immigrants are stealing jobs um, in, in its most extreme version, referring to immigration as an invasion uh, or an infestation as our former president did in one of his tweets. Um, so th there's a sense of racial resentment and a sense of anti-government sentiment that really cut to the core of this uh, kind of umbrella of far-right extremism that we're referring to. Now, it's very decentralized, and that's what the slide's meant to depict, is kind of a loosely distributed network. We're not talking about a, 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 a national organization, a national single organization with a top-down hierarchy with clearly delineated roles and positions and, and leadership. There are leaders, there are organizations, but there's also a lot of what you might just refer to as adherents. That is individuals who subscribe to the beliefs, who identify uh, with the cause, they may affiliate with specific groups or they may not. Uh, there's a lot of variability in that respect. 
Um, the decentralization that really characterizes far right extremism should not be confused with a lack of coherence or disorganization. Very different in that respect, in part because the decentralization is in many respects very intentional. It reflects what's called leaderless resistance. And this is the idea of organizing your, your, yourself in a way to um, uh, essentially prevent law enforcement infiltration as a way to present, um, uh, as a way to be viewed as, as uh, having a, a lack of leadership and having a lack of organization, when in fact, uh, things are, are still very much organized and there is um, you know, different types of uh, uh, leadership that exists. There are different types of affiliations that exist that tie people together, that create certain kinds of commitments and, and uh, a certain sense of obligation to, to the cause and people will act uh, on those commitments and sense of obligation in, in varying ways, sometimes in violent ways and, and sometimes uh, nonviolent ways. But you get that uh, full range of, of activity that's still very much part of the organization, um, despite the fact that it appears to be uh, leaderless and appears to be disorganized. Um, another aspect of the decentralized aspect of far right extremism is the fact that this de de decentralization really reflects how ingrained it is within a US society. And it's a much more invisible and harder to kind of discern or detect it in, in many respects because it has such a long history in the United States and US society. And it's so embedded in US society in, in many respects, including within our institutions. And so when you, for instance, look at white supremacist terrorism, it's really the only type of political violence in our country's history that's been state supported uh, that you can't really say that about, say, for instance, left wing extremism or Islamic extremism. And, and what I mean by that, just to give you an example, is if we go back to the murder of civil rights workers, um, Cheney, um, Goodman and, and Schwerner, you know, they were killed by uh, the KKK, but as also in, in concert with the local sheriff's department. In, in Mississippi, in Philadelphia, Mississippi, where, where those murders occurred, uh, it was uh, such that the KKK and, and the, the Sheriff's Department were working in concert together, and there were members of the Sheriff's Department who were also members of the Klan. And that's not just the case in Philadelphia. We were to look at um, Mississippi Sheriff's Department in many counties across the state at that time, this is the early 60s, uh, you would find up, you know, upwards of 30% of, of sheriffs that had Klan affiliations. So you see that level of penetration into institutions. And of course, um, Mississippi is just one state that, where that, that was happening across the country and, and, and not just restricted to the South, but this is happening in, in, in the Northeast and the Midwest and, and the, the, the Western part of the United States as well. So this level of, of embeddedness in our society is, is characteristic of far-right extremism in a way that's very different than other forms of extremism. I think that's important to keep in mind and to recognize because it, it has an impact on, on the present uh, context and, and what we see today. So my first point that I wanna start off with is that looks can be deceiving. Uh, another way of saying this might be old wine and new bottles, that just because things appear in ways that we don't expect or associate with extremism, we, we should be very careful about, about those kind of uh, assumptions that we sometimes make. If you recall the Charlottesville um, violent uh, Unite the Right rally, uh, the two-day affair on Friday and Saturday ultimately culminated in the car attack that killed Heather Heyer on Saturday, and the dozens of other individuals that were injured, not, not only in the car attack, but in the assaults that were committed by the folks who, who attended the Unite the Right rally, which was you know, basically a neo-Nazi rally. It was the largest white supremacist demonstration, public demonstration in more than a decade in the US. And uh, of course, there was a lot of, of um, documentary evidence, video footage and photographic images that were generated from, from those two days. And the Friday night torch rally, uh, where they were uh, marching on the uh, UVA campus and ultimately surrounded a, a, a mostly a group of undergraduate students at UVA around a Thomas Jefferson uh, statue, uh, and ultimately assaulted some of those students um, and and were chanting things like "blood and soil" from from Nazi Germany. 
and other slogans like Jews will not replace us to uh, essentially reflect their belief in, in uh, essentially the idea that the white race is on the verge of extinction. Um, that, that Friday night uh, torch rally where many of the folks were wearing, uh, attending, um, wearing polos and khakis and that, that seemed to get a lot of attention and people seemed uh, in many respects surprised uh, at the appearance of these uh, relatively young uh, folks that were dressed in, in that manner. And it, and it didn't, um, it wasn't consistent with, I think, a lot of the ideas of, um, you know, neo-Nazis having swastika tattoos on their foreheads, and wearing Klan robes and things of this nature, these more overt signs of, of involvement in this kind of extremism. Th this looked different. And so people, I think, to some extent, at least, had a hard time, uh, you know, kind of understanding that. You know, there's been neo-Nazis and Nazis that have worn khakis and polos uh, for, for far before 2017. That, that's not new. And, um, you know, there are, uh, in many respects, um, we continue to have kind of problems understanding uh, the difference between our preconceived notions about what an extremist looks like and what an extremist is. And, and we saw that again in January 6th with the attempted insurrection in DC. A uh, lot of references to these being regular people attending the January 6th uh, insurrection the rally proceeded. Uh, of course, regular people because that's extremists are largely regular people. Uh, and so sometimes I think we forget that, that um, a person who subscribes to these beliefs and feelings and involved in these kind of activities, they are just regular people. And you see this photo of this young woman uh, holding her baby. She's a, a neo-Nazi. That photo image comes from the early 2000s and um, looks like a person could be your next door neighbor, um, your coworker, your colleague, because that's what extremists look like. Um, the vast majority of folks that I spent time with during my uh, field work looked like you know her or, or of some version of that. Regular looking people uh, doing regular things in terms of attending school and attending uh, jobs and living in regular neighborhoods, but holding to these beliefs and feelings and involved in, in certain ways and in varying degrees in, in extremist activities. Um, so that, that's really nothing new, but it, it's a, um, uh, you know, I think, Part of the problem is, is that these misconceptions um, make it harder for us to see the greater degree of complexity of this problem. And, and frankly, the level of sophistication that often exists on the far right. And one area where we've seen this is their use of technology. And this issue about technology, uh, really in terms of computer technology, uh, beginning with electronic bulletin boards in the 1980s and then moving into websites in the 1990s and now more recently with podcasts, uh, mainstream social media sites like Facebook and Twitter and semi-encrypted sites like Telegram. All of this allows for far-right extremists to with, you know, with relatively easy access to disseminate a, a wide range of narratives, propaganda, some of which are very explicit and even openly violent, and then some of which is much more coded and seeks to push these ideas and emotions further into the mainstream. Here you see this bar graph of a Twitter activity among white supremacists, you know, going back to uh, the 2016-17 era, uh, where they're outperforming um, ISIS, who had, who had been using um, you know, Twitter quite a bit to, to uh, disseminate propaganda for recruitment purposes. Uh, and, and you see the bar graphs are actually, di they're disaggregated. So you have white supremacists, uh, white nationalists, white nationalist recruiters, and then Nazis. Um, so if you were to actually you know, combine all three, then you'd even have a higher level of performance. Um, uh, this, in this research study, they, they separated those three out. Um, and, and so I think it's important to recognize that part of the far right um, has been very good at using different types of technology, computer technology in particular, to uh, message and to try and shape narratives. And that, for instance, uh, just as one example, um, in terms of the ability of the far right to kind of push their talking points into greater visibility, you will find on the far right the discussion of critical race theory. For decades, you know, this has been floating around in different pockets and they've been 
uh, discussing uh, different aspects of critical race theory, trying to frame it uh, as anti-white, as anti-American and, and so forth. And now just in the last couple of years, we've seen this discussion really explode into the quote unquote mainstream. And really in some respects, at least some segments of the mainstream helping radicalize that mainstream. And of course that's the goal of far right extremism is um, doing as much as possible to push the mainstream in their direction. They're trying to infiltrate the mainstream in, in many respects, but they're also trying to pull the mainstream in their direction. And they do this by identifying hot button issues, now critical race theory, certainly uh, at, at uh, various points in time, immigration has been a hot button issue that they've used to their advantage. So they're very good, very adept at finding those issues and trying to mobilize around them. One of the points that I think is important to underscore is that in some respects, there's been too much focus on categorizing into distinct buckets, uh, different aspects of far right extremism. For example, are the Proud Boys racist? But wait a second, they're multi, they have multicultural membership. Now, from my perspective, if you look at the fact that they were founded by a person who wrote a blog, 10 Reasons I Hate Jews, and frequently used the N-word, that seems to be pretty good indication of the, the Proud Boys. Or how about the fact that members wear t-shirts emblazoned with 6MWE, which stands for 6 million wasn't enough. Um, a reference to the Holocaust and the, the, the idea that um, uh, if only the Nazis had, had murdered, slaughtered more people. Uh, which is not an uncommon belief among white supremacists uh, to this idea that the, the Holocaust um, didn't go far enough. Um, so it seems to me that uh, the fact that the Proud Boys, um, you know, to some extent attract uh, some degree of, of, of diverse uh, membership and have some degree of diverse uh, appeal is really neither new nor, nor, nor frankly, very surprising. Um, this type of kind of fascistic far-right extremism has always had broader appeal than we often want to recognize. Now, in many respects, we've kind of done the same thing with the anti-government militia movement or so-called patriots, as they like to refer to themselves, groups like the Oath Keepers. We want to view them as a completely distinct bucket from, say, traditional white supremacists. Um, you know, despite the fact that in, in many cases, individuals will move back and forth uh, between uh, these types of groups. Uh, in some cases, organizations themselves uh, have substantial overlaps or linkages between these different types. And that in many cases, it's really hard to distinguish. So for example, the first uh, group that I did field work with back in 1997, they were called, they called themselves the Rocky Mountain Militia. So they identified themselves as a militia group, but they were also um, uh, racist skinheads in the mix. Um, Christian identity, white supremacist, uh, religious interpretation of the Bible. Um, you know, you, you had a whole kind of uh, different assortment of folks, neo-Nazis that were part of this single group that called themselves the militia. So to, if you were to just assume that they were distinct from, um, you know, other types of, of uh, white supremacists, uh, in that case, you would have missed a really substantial, important component of that group, uh, their membership, their ideology, uh, and, and essentially um, how, you know, what they were um, standing for in terms of uh, their beliefs and the cause that they identified with. So oftentimes the groups are kind of hybrids of sorts and they and really don't fit well into a specific bucket. I think it's also important to remember that in the case of the, the second wave of the militia movement, which you really see kind of emerging um, after the election of Barack Obama in 2008, our country's first black president. So it, the, the second wave, the first wave we see in the, in the early 90s um, after Ruby Ridge and, and Waco, you see the first wave of the militias at that time. And, and then the second wave around 2008, 2000 into 2009, the Oath Keepers were founded, for example, in 2009. 
they don't form though after the Patriot Act um, in 2001. So for, for a, a movement that likes to focus on the idea that they're only responding to uh, kind of uh, loss of, of constitutional liberty, uh, concerned about constitutional protections, concerned about federal overreach, they, 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 they re-emerged um, in response to Obama's election, not in response to the passing of the Patriot Act. The, the most legal scholars who would, would certainly agree was a pretty substantial curtailment of constitutional protections. So, you know, I think you have to ask yourself, is it just coincidence that the second wave of the militia movement uh, emerges in response to Obama's presidency? Uh, is that really just a coincidence or is part of their reemergence tied to a broader sense of anxiety and insecurity about cultural changes, demographic changes that are linked to, again, symbolically, uh, the first, uh, the election of the first black president, but also issues around immigration, changing demography, um, other types of changes within uh, kind of culture. That, um, that, that that second wave of the militia movement certainly seems very much in response to some of those things that go well beyond just their, their stated concerns uh, about constitutional in, infringement and um, uh, loss of, of liberty or loss of, of, of um, uh, sovereignty. So I think that's important to recognize that um, sometimes we want to over distinguish in terms of, of far right extremism and, and try and put things into uh, different types of, of buckets. And the end result is that we focus too much on individual trees and that we're missing the broader forest of far right extremism that in the meantime has mobilized at, at so many different levels and in so many different ways that, that we're currently you know, really confronting. And so this brings me really to some of my concluding points about how do we think about framing the problem? Um, what types of specific aspects of far-right extremism um, seem to be priorities in terms of what we're confronting? Um, first, I think we have to stop treating these threats as momentary. That is when a horrific shooting rampage occurs or when something like uh, January 6 uh, happens, an attempted insurrection. We can't only focus at those moments in time and then lose focus um, in the aftermath. In other words, our attention span is far too short-lived uh, as it currently stands. We have to remain um, much more focused and vigilant about the real breadth um, that we currently face in terms of the threat of far-right extremism. In, in many respects, it's a, a, a substantial threat on democracy as we know it. And part of, I think, uh, sometimes one of the obstacles to addressing this is that we're too tethered to the idea that, quote unquote, it can't happen here. That is, our democratic institutions will always find a way. It seems to me that's not the path forward to effectively being able to resist what we're starting to see and what's been developing for quite some time, quite frankly. And what really, uh, to frame it as a full-scale attack on democracy that's coming from multiple directions uh, seems to be important in terms of capturing and putting this in potentially a nonpartisan lens, that is, what we're dealing with is not simply um, a, a, a democratic Republican issue in, in a traditional sense, but what we're dealing with is uh, opponents of democracy versus folks who want to uh, retain democracy and increase its uh, vibrancy. And so I wanna call attention to two issues in particular that I think are, are extremely important as it relates to, to these issues. One is voting rights. Um, every far-right extremist that I've spoken with over the years will tell you that they thrive on polarization. So the extent to which society is polarized is good news for them. This is something that they feel they can take advantage of and they're able to, to uh, mobilize around polarization. 
Also delegitimizing institutions. As our institutions uh, lose credibility and legitimacy, they feel this is also good news for them. That is the cracks and the crevices, the major gulfs and gaps that begin to emerge and appear within society are helpful for them in terms of driving wedges. And so it seems to me that one of the ways you combat this type of threat is by securing voting rights. Um, at a meeting not too long ago, uh, we were presenting, uh, myself and a couple of colleagues were presenting uh, about some of our research that we've done over the years. And we, it was a both governmental and non-governmental audience. And one of the individuals from one of the government agencies asked if there was one thing, you had to pick one thing that the government could do to help stem the tide of right-wing extremism, what would you pick? And, and I responded first and, and I actually picked voting rights, that this would be the one, if I had to pick one thing, this is it. And one of my colleagues kind of suggested that that was a little bit far afield from what we were talking about. And I think that's a problem, that there is that sense that um, what is, um, you know, responding to the threat of far right extremism have to do with securing voting rights? But well, it has a lot to do, uh, in part because far right extremism is, is uh, the intended goal is to not only divide people, but also to uh, reduce um, uh, empowerment for certain groups within society, that is disempower certain groups within society to have a society that's structured in unequal ways as it re relates to things like um, uh, political influence. And so, you know, I think this is, is a critical issue. Second and related threats to public officials, um, just getting ready to start a new project, looking at this more closely. But one of the things that I think uh, we would all agree is that you can't have democracy if you don't have um, uh, vibrant voting rights. And you can't have democracy if public officials are constantly facing death threats for doing their job. And by public officials, I'm talking about everything from election officials to health officials to education officials uh, at local, state, and federal levels. We are seeing unprecedented uh, levels of threats being directed uh, these folks' way. And that is a... Um, a disaster when it comes to uh, democracy. Uh, so if you um, have an erosion of voting rights and you have elected officials uh, who uh, find themselves in the position of having to go into hiding, sell their homes, resign from their positions because of death threats, it seems to me that those are just minimum basic thresholds to have a democracy. You have to have those two things. You have to have voting rights secured and you have to have public officials protected and able to do their jobs without the threat of violence. Uh, it doesn't guarantee a vibrant democracy, but it guarantees you some semblance of a democracy. So that's where things are today in my view that we are really teetering um, in some dangerous directions where, where really we face a situation where voting rights are not secured and public officials are not secured. Two minimum requirements for a democracy. So. Um, that, um, you know, unfortunately puts us in, in a position to where we really need to, I think, start recognizing the peril that we find ourselves in today. Um, so I want to end there on a, on a somewhat a downer note, but with the idea that unless we are aware and recognize the nature of the threat, and in particular, some of the specific areas of greatest vulnerability, we really can't move forward in terms of starting to, to um, address these problems in a um, more multifaceted and comprehensive way, which is, of course, what, what's required. Um, the, the piecemeal solutions are, are not enough to address the substantial nature of these, these issues. And so I will go ahead and leave it there and I'll look forward to um, having a discussion.